And we're now recording. All right, so I was actually almost done with section four. So we're looking at the calendar. I think I can finish five four today and maybe sneak in a little bit of five five, in which case I'll do a little bit of five five. I still have all of these extra days here. I was going to use it for reviewing for the final exam. <clears throat> so most likely Monday and Tuesday, I'll go back over previous exams and review those for you. Again, I don't want to change the date of the exam. I guess ideally, if, if I could make the date of the exam float, I might make the exam on Monday, and then we just take the rest of the time to review. But since I already set this in stone, we'll just keep it that. Okay, so I'll start reviewing for the final on Monday and Tuesday. You don't have to think about it or look at it. Maybe after the test on Thursday, then you can look at the videos we have on Monday and Tuesday um, reviewing for the final exam. And see, Wednesday, I'll have the usual question and answer session before the exam. Last regular exam is Thursday the 20th. Okay, and I'll uh, review the last exam on Friday the 21st and take any last minute questions you might have. Okay, reminder, our final exam is on Monday the 24th, 8, 10 to 10, 40. Um, study off the old exams of which we'll review, you know, all this week over here. Um, you don't have to turn any homework in for the final exam. Now, this last exam on Thursday the 20th, you do have to turn in all of this, the usual 70% rule, right? <clears throat> but there's no extra homework you have to turn in for the final exam. As far as cheat sheets, you can bring in all the formula sheets from the previous exams. Okay, so if you still have the formula sheet from exam one, two, and three, and so on, uh, so you should have four, and the fifth one is still in progress, I guess, right? Just bring them all, okay? If you threw it away, you lost it, you can reconstruct it. If you say to yourself, I wish I had put such and such a formula on test three or whatever, you can go back and put it in and have all the formula sheets that you want from the previous exams for the final exam, okay? All right, so any questions about that? Okay, and let's see. Yeah, Antonio, I got you. So you're good. All right, so I'm aiming to finish 5-4, sneak in a little bit of 5-5. Five, five. I don't have to do that much because I still have Wednesday and Thursday for that. Okay, Friday will be our last quiz. Again, I'll try to give you most of the class time for the quiz, but we've got some spare days, it looks like. Um, to do all the stuff that we need to do. Okay, so anybody with any other questions before we start? Uh, any rules, regulations, questions about the test five and the final exam? We're ending real fast, folks. Monday the 24th is what, less than two weeks away now. So before you know it, we're finished. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start. <clears throat> okay, continuing on with five, four. Reminder, just be able to distinguish between indefinite integrals, like five and six. You integrate and your answer is gonna be an antiderivative plus C. And then you have definite integrals, where you integrate, you don't need the plus C, you plug in the top number, plug in the bottom number and subtract, okay? And that gives you the exact value of the signed area, as we said, okay? All right, so I did a bunch last time and we'll do a bunch more. Okay, so 5.4 number 23. <clears throat> Integral from negative two to zero. One half t to the fourth plus one fourth t cubed minus t dt. Should be pretty straightforward. Looks like a bunch of power rules. Okay, notice the symbol, and I want you to follow the symbol. I can take off points even if you got everything else right, if you don't have the correct symbols. It's on the left side. The funny looking S at the beginning is on the left side. After you integrate, it migrates over to the right side and straightens out, negative two to zero. That's just a convention. All right, this should be pretty straightforward. One half t to the fifth over five plus one fourth t to the fourth over four minus t, of course, is t to the one, so t squared over two. <clears throat> okay, clean up the algebra a little bit. That's one tenth t to the fifth. One over four times four is one sixteenth t to the fourth minus one half t squared from negative two to zero. Plug in zero. 
uh, plugging in zero is real easy, right? Zero, 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 zero. Zero to the fifth is zero. Zero to the fourth is zero. Zero squared is zero. Times any coefficient is zero. Zero plus zero is zero. Zero minus zero is zero. It's zero, right? So the harder one is negative two. Negative two to the fifth power is negative 32 over 10. Negative two to the fourth is 16. One sixteenth of 16 is one. And negative two here, negative two squared is four. Four times negative a half is negative two. So forget all that, that's nothing, right? Distribute the minus sign. So positive 32 over 10 minus one plus two, that reduces to 16 over five plus one, 21 over five. Okay. Right, so that's that. What is that? That's the net signed area above the x-axis, okay? Again, this thing might be above the x-axis, might be below the x-axis for part of the time. Don't really know and we don't really care. The net amount of area bounded by the graph and the x-axis is a positive 21 over five. So there's more area above than below. Okay, maybe it's all above. I don't know offhand and I don't really wanna spend the time to figure out whether it is or not. It's not really that important. Okay, 29, integral from one to four of four plus six u over radical u, du. In the letter, it doesn't matter, but if it's x, this is dx. If it's theta, d theta, w, dw, and so on. All right, it's a quotient. Now, you might say, why don't you just use a quotient root? So for reason, there is no quotient root for integrals. So what do I do in this case? Just divide. Keep in mind that's u to the one half. So I'm gonna go four divided by u to the one half, which means bring the u to the one half upstairs as four u to the negative half, plus six u to the one divided by u to the half is u to the half, right? So that gives me that. All right. Uh, that's just a stray mark there, ignore that. Okay, power root, negative a half plus one is positive a half. So four times u to the half, divided by a half, right? Multiply by two, plus six. U to the one more than one half is one and a half or three halves. Six U to the three halves divided by three halves means times two thirds from one to four. <clears throat> okay, clean this up. Anything to the one half means square root. So eight radical U. And let's see, six divided by three is two. Two times two is four. Four U to the three halves. Okay, so parentheses, plug in four, minus parentheses, plug in one. Okay, so put a four right there, eight radical four, four times four to the three halves, minus eight times plug in one, radical one, plus four times one to the three halves. Well, square root of one is one, one to anything is one. So that's just simply eight plus four or 12, right? <clears throat> Let's do this, eight times two, 16, four to the three halves power means square root of four, two, two cubed is eight, and four times eight is 32. <clears throat> okay, so that's 48 minus 12, final answer is 36. All right, so these are definite integrals. Remember for definite integrals, the final answer is a definite number. There are definite numbers here. Problem is finished, I'll dig a little deeper. This graph is always positive between one and four. I know that for sure, right? That's positive, that's positive, that's positive if I'm going from one to four. So the true area under the curve, whatever this thing looks like from one to four, bounded by the graph and the x-axis between one and four, the actual area is 36 square units. Okay, pretty powerful theorem. Now, when we were doing, you know, L sub N, R sub N, and M sub N, right? Left endpoints, right endpoints, and midpoints. You know, chop, 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 do my Riemann sum, base times height, base times height. Very tedious. We were only getting an approximation. Now look at what's happening. So that's the way it always is when we teach calculus. You do the hard way, then you appreciate it when we do the easy way, right? First time you learn the derivative, 
right? You did limit h approach to zero, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Oh man, this is real tedious. Now you have all the shortcuts. Same thing for integration. You got to do the hard cut before you appreciate it, the shortcut, right? So you did, you know, left endpoints, right endpoints, midpoints, chop, 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 base time site, base time site, base time site, add them up, very tedious, only an approximation. Now, I'm not chopping this up in any pieces or whatever. I'm just integrating, and it's the exact answer. Very nice, right? Okay, 49 is not really that much harder. It's just sort of a change of scenery, as it were. Okay, 49 on page 409. The area of the region that lies to the right of the y-axis and to the left of the parabola, x equals 2y minus y squared, the shaded region, is given by the integral of 0 to 2, 2y minus y squared dy. Okay, this is x as a function of y, which we're not used to. We're used to y as a function of x. Now, when you get to calc two, you get a lot more x as a function of y. Okay. By the way, you might say, this doesn't look like a function. It's not a function y as a function of x, but it is a function x as a function of y, which would have to pass the horizontal line test. An easy way to think about it that the text talks about is if you just turn the picture 90 degrees, right? And look at that and say, oh yeah, that looks like a function which passes the vertical line test. Translation, if I turn the page 90 degrees, is it has to pass the horizontal line test. So X is a function of Y. The only reason why it's weird is because we've always done Y as a function of X, right? So ever since you first learned functions, it was always Y equals F of X, Y equals F of X, Y equals F of X, vertical line test and all that, okay? So when you hear X is a function of Y, say that's weird, okay? But it's legitimate, it's doing the same thing. <laughs> In fact, long time ago, we could have said, Let's learn X as a function of Y, and you just do X equals F of Y, X equals F of Y, then you would have thought this was normal. And then when you saw Y as a function of X, you would have said, oh, that looks abnormal, right? So it's really just a matter of frequency of seeing it, right? This is a perfectly good function, X is a function of Y, we're just not used to it, right? So this is just a heads up that when you get to calc two, you get a lot more X as a function of Y. So be comfortable going both ways, okay? And Y goes from zero to two. Other than that, it's really the same thing. How do you find that area and integrate as Y goes from zero to two of two Y minus Y squared? Okay, so that's what that's all about. The actual computation is not that big a deal. So integral from zero to two, two Y minus Y squared. Integral of two Y is two y squared over two, which is y squared, minus y cubed over three from zero to two. Okay, you notice when you plug in zero, you get zero. That happens a lot. Doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen a lot. <clears throat> so zero minus zero is zero, right? Plug in two, four minus eight cubed, which is 12 over three minus eight over three, four thirds, final answer is four thirds. All right, so it's not really that big a deal. So <laughs> this area is four thirds. Okay. And again, a heads up when you get to calc two, if you look at this as y is a function of x, you might get kind of stuck and say, well, I could solve for y. Well, maybe I can't solve for y. It's a little bit hard to go this way. Uh, but if you look at x as a function of y, it becomes much easier. Okay, or the idea of turning your head and looking at that picture and say, oh yeah, I know what to do. Okay. So in Calc 2, you get some situations where you look at some graph and say, hmm, I can't really figure it out with my traditional y equals f of x. Instead, look at it as x is a function of y and it becomes an equivalently easy problem to do that you couldn't do with y as a function of x. Okay, so I'm gonna share that with you. And I'm done with that page. So let me do my focus job here quickly with that. Okay. Okay, I just was gonna show you a couple more. Uh, 35, 5.435. Then go from zero to one, x to the 10th. 
10 to the x. So they kind of reverse these. <clears throat> okay. This is the power root. This is not the power root. This is not an exponent. This is an exponential function. So this one is x to the 11th over 11. But for exponentials, don't go 10 to the x plus 1 over x plus 1. Right? Exponentials are different. Now, do you remember how to take the derivative of 10 to the x? 10 to the x ln 10. Therefore, when you integrate, 10 to the x over ln 10. Right? So I have x to the 11th over 11 plus 10 to the x over ln 10 from 0 to 1. OK, and the rest is pretty much the same. Plug in 1, 1 over 11 plus 10 to the 1 is 10. So 10 over ln 10 minus plug in 0. That's 0. 10 to the 0 is 1. So 1 over ln 10. 10 over ln 10 minus 1 over ln 10 is 9 over ln 10. So final answer is 1 11th plus 9 over natural log of 10. OK. All right, so that's it for 35. <clears throat> Maybe I'll refer you back to this. And again, if you want to put this on your cheat sheet, you may. Table of indefinite integrals on page 403. I can try to, integral of b to the x, b to the x divided by l and b, right? So the integral of 10 to the x, 10 to the x divided by l and 10. You have all these other ones, but they're basically just backwards from the derivative. So technically, I don't think you need them. It's almost like take the right-hand side, differentiate, you get the left side, right? Like this one, tangent secant squared. Well, you should already know derivative of tangent secant squared. Therefore, the integral of secant squared is tangent plus c, and so on. Likewise for this one, right? Derivative of secant x is secant x tangent x. Therefore, integral of secant x tangent x dx is secant x plus c, okay? Okay, last one I was going to show you, and then I'm done with the section 61. <laughs> Again, a word problem involving acceleration and so forth. Acceleration function in meters per second squared and in the initial velocity are given for particle moving along line. Find a velocity at time t and a distance traveled during a given time interval. Okay, so they have acceleration. Based on that, you can get the velocity at five. And then total distance traveled, I will integrate the velocity function from zero to 10. Okay. So A of T is T plus four. Okay, V of T is the integral of T plus four DT. So that's gonna be T squared over two plus four T plus a constant. It says V of zero equals five. That means when I'm at the velocity function, if I plug in zero here and here, the answer is five. In other words, five is equal to zero plus zero plus C. So C equals five. So I have my velocity function, one half T squared plus four T plus five. Okay, and now, it talks about the total distance traveled from zero to 10. So if you integrate the velocity function, we have the distance traveled. And it says go from zero to 10. So I integrate from zero to 10. And that gives me the total distance. So S of t is the integral from zero to 10 of 1 half t squared plus 4 t plus 5 dt. All right, so that should be pretty easy. It's a polynomial. One half t cubed over three plus four t squared over two plus five t from zero to 10. Clean this up a little bit. That's one six t cubed plus four divided by two is two, two t squared plus five t from zero to 10. I can tell when you plug in zero, you get zero, right? Put a zero here, zero here. Zero cubed is zero, divided by six is zero, zero squared is zero, times two is zero, five times zero is zero. Add them all up, zero. 
So I only have to worry about the 10. So 10 cubed is 1,000 over 6. 10 squared is 100 times 2 is 250. So 500 over 3 plus 250. Do a little bit of arithmetic. 1250 over 3 meters, or 416.6 repeating. 416 and 2 thirds meters. So that's the total distance traveled in this case. All right, that's about it. Uh, I was going to start 5.5 a little bit. Let me check to see if there's any questions from the chat. I don't see any questions right now. Okay. So, folks, we're down to our last section of Calc 1, believe it or not. Made it all the way there. So, we only have 5.5 five left. It's not a short section, though. Okay. So, yes, we only have one section, but there's quite a bit to it. Okay. So, I'll sneak in a little bit today. Uh, on my schedule, I was only going to go up to 5.4. So technically, I could stop, but I'm not going to. If I have a chance to go ahead, you know, maybe something goes wrong. Maybe my internet doesn't work like last Friday, right? So if I get a chance to sneak in a little bit of the next section, I will, and we'll still probably end early. Okay. All right. So start some of 5.5. Let's see. Question about 59. Uh, let's see. Okay. That one from yesterday, right? Okay. Um, I'm not sure I can get that quickly because I may have already put that away. Ah, here we go. Do I want to do it? Yeah, I mean... Anything now is just gravy, it's extra stuff. <clears throat> so 59, so you have a velocity function, which looks like this. The thing that makes this a little tricky is it's part of the time positive and part of the time negative. In case you're wanting to look at 61, say, how come you didn't do that for 61? 61, the acceleration is always positive, t plus four. t is going from zero to 10. If you plug in any number between zero and 10, it's always positive. Okay. And the velocity will always be positive also. Okay, 59, it's not true. 59, you're starting to the left and then you're going to the right. Okay. Well, you can plug in, plug in zero, you get negative five. So I'm going five units per second, I think it is, to the left. By the time you get to T equals three, plug in three, three times three is nine minus five is four. 3 comma 4. Okay, solve this for 0, 5 thirds. Okay, so you're traveling to the left, and I don't know if your picture is a mirror image, but my left is that way. So you're walking to the left until t equals 5 thirds, and then you turn around and then go to the right. Displacement is how far I am from home. So everything here is considered positive. Everything here is considered negative. <clears throat> so you take this area, considered positive, subtract this area, which is negative. One half base times height. Distance traveled, just add both of these areas. Okay. I mean, it doesn't matter if I walk to the left or to the right, I'm still getting exercise. I'm still huffing and puffing, so to speak. All right. So figure out this area, one half base times height. Figure out this area, one half base times height. The difference is the displacement. The sum is the distance that I travel. Okay. All right. So that's that. And I will begin sum of 5.5. Substitution rule. Okay, substitution. I sometimes call it the chain rule in reverse. It's the reverse of the chain rule. <clears throat> We're gonna do something called a U substitution. 
the variable that we want to substitute is u. That's pretty much by convention. There's no law that says you can't use the letter v or t or w. Okay, but normally we use u. I want you to use u also, just so I, I can get uniformity when I grade your exams and quizzes and so forth. U substitution. Here's the principle. In an integration problem, look for a function and its derivative or the derivative times a constant. Okay, so within the problem, look for a function and its derivative or the derivative times a constant. Then the rule is let u be equal to the function. du is the derivative of the function dx. And we've actually seen that notation before when doing differentials. You might recall we did differentials a while back. Okay, one way to think of this is, suppose I wrote du dx, the Leibniz notation, du dx, that's a symbol for derivative, right? Du dx. If I multiply both sides by dx, it looks like this. Du equals the derivative of the function dx. Okay. Yeah, no, it, all of this is just fuzzy right now, but hopefully as I do more and more problems, you'll understand what it's talking about. Within the problem, look for a function and its derivative. If you don't quite see the derivative, the derivative times a constant. Cannot be times a variable, it has to be times a constant. Okay, so let me just start off by showing you an example. So 5.5, number one. And let me show you the homework for the last time this semester. Okay, one to 71. Uh, so page 418, 1 through 5, 7, 9, 11. And on page 419, show up to 25-ish. That's up to 37-ish, 45. 47, okay, that should show you 55 to about 63, I guess. 63 to 71, and that should be the rest of it, okay. Number one, okay, temporarily ignore all the red stuff. It's the reason why I changed colors. So the red wasn't there originally, the original was, integral of cosine two X DX. Okay, to make the problem easier, I would want this to be a U, right? So let U equal two X. The book even made that suggestion, that U equals two X. DU equals two DX. And this is what I'm talking about. If I use the Leibniz notation, L-E-I-B-N-I-Z, you don't have to memorize that. It's the D notation, du dx equals two, right? Symbol for derivative. If you multiply both sides by dx, it looks like this, du equals two dx. Okay, so that means in order for me to substitute, I need two dx. There's no two in there. So I simply put a two inside and a one half outside. Two times one half is one. Right, I've multiplied my expression by one, so I get an equivalent expression. Okay. So here's how I substitute. Two dx is my du. Two x, I call that u. I have a half outside. Okay, so one more time, make the problem easier. Instead of two x, I make it a u. So u equals two x. DU equals two DX. So you don't have to take this step over here. You don't have to write DU DX equals two and then multiply both sides by DX. Go straight to DU equals two DX. <clears throat> okay, the original problem did not have a two. Put it in. You can do that for constants, not variables. So for instance, you're not allowed to put an X here and a one over X outside. That's not allowed. Okay, two and one half is okay. Now I can change two DX to DU substitute change 2x to u. There's a half in front. So my i, my capital I will always stand for the original integral. Okay, so the original integral, that prevents you from having to write this all over again. 
Alternatively, I could write integral of cosine two x dx, but nobody feels like doing that. I don't feel like doing that. So my convention is capital I, means the original integral is one half integral cosine of two x now becomes cosine of u, two dx is du. And there it is, and I know how to do that now. Okay, and notice this convention of the matching of the variables is still there. When you have a u, you gotta have a du. When you have an x, you gotta have dx. When you have theta, you gotta have d theta and so on. All right, so integral of cosine is sine. So one half sine of u plus c, we are once again doing indefinite integrals. We'll do definite integrals also. And then just change u back to what it was. What was u? 2x. So final answer, 1 half sine 2x plus c. Okay, so one more time for this first example. Instead of having something quote unquote complicated, I guess this is not too complicated, but this could be a mess. Just call it u. Let u be 2x. Take the derivative of u. du is 2dx. I saw the dx, I don't see the two. Put a two inside, one half outside, two times one half is one. Change that to cosine u, change that to du. Look at this and say, oh yeah, I know how to do that. That's sine, integral of cosine is sine. One half sine u plus c, change u back. Final answer, one half sine two x plus c. And as you should know, how can I check any integration? differentiate. What's the derivative of one half sine two x plus c? Well, you already know the derivative of the constant is zero. <clears throat> derivative of one half sine two x is one half cosine two x times two by the chain rule. Well, one half times two is one, that cancels out. Cosine two x, it works, works perfectly. Okay, so we're looking for a function and its derivative for these kind of problems. All right, okay, number five. And if possible, ignore all the red. The original was integral of x cubed over x to the fourth minus five dx. I'm going to show it to you from here. x cubed over x to the fourth minus five dx. Do you see a function and its derivative, sort of? And when you see polynomials like that, a good thing to look for is a polynomial that has a degree one higher than the other. Okay, this is fourth degree, this is third degree. So you know right away the derivative of this is gonna be something like this, right? So that tells me how to go. Let u be the denominator. <clears throat> u equals x to the fourth minus fifth du is 4x cubed dx. The derivative of x to the fourth minus five is 4x cubed dx. Now, the original was x cubed dx. x cubed dx, no four. Put inside a four. Outside, put a one fourth. That way, the next step all of this, 4x cubed dx, 4x cubed dx, is going to be du. x to the fourth minus 5, u. Very nice. So my integral is 1 fourth integral of du over u. Okay. And if you're not familiar with du over u, by the way, you should start getting comfortable with du over u. It shows up quite a bit in calc 2. You can pretend there's a 1 there, right? So 1 over u, you should say, oh, yeah, that's my natural log. Okay, so when you see the integral of du over u, it's one over u du, that's my natural law. So one fourth ln absolute value of u plus c, and then just change u back to what it was, x to the fourth minus five. Final answer, one fourth natural log absolute value of x to the fourth minus five plus a constant. And there we go. All right, uh, I was gonna do just maybe one more and that was sufficient. Uh, we got plenty of time. 
Okay, so after I do the next one, I'll be done in a couple of minutes. Um, if you want to ask any questions, you may, or questions from any other section, and if not, we'll just end early. Again, I'm, so I'm right on par. So instead of ending real early, I decided to do a little bit, sneak in a little bit, and still end a little bit early, right? Just in case something wrong happens, so to speak. Okay, seven. Integral of x radical one minus x squared dx. So again, temporarily ignore all red and green. Okay, so from the beginning, do you see a function and its derivative, sort of? <laughs> the derivative of one minus x squared is going to be something involving x, right? Second degree, first degree. So that tells me how to substitute. So that u equal one minus x squared, whose derivative is negative two x dx. Okay, so here's the original. I cannot change it until I see negative two x dx. There's an x, there's a dx. What's missing? Negative two. You gotta have the negative two. So I put in negative two outside negative a half. Okay, exact same principle here. I think somebody in the chat asked about the four. Okay, I cannot change to du until I see four x cubed dx. You must see exactly four x cubed dx in order to substitute. The original had x cubed dx. So am I allowed to change it to du? No, you must have four x cubed dx. The original had x cubed dx, there wasn't any four. So I put in a four, you must have it. But if you put a four inside, you need to multiply by one fourth. So I'm multiplying the whole expression by one, okay? Long time ago, you had one as the identity property. If you multiply an expression by one, you get an equivalent expression, right? Now that I see four X cubed DX, I can make it DU, okay? Now that I put a negative two, negative two X DX, is to you. They don't have to be together. See everything I see in green, that's negative two x dx. Multiplication is commutative. You know, you can just pick this up and move it over there, right? So negative two x dx. Now I can erase that and change it to du. That becomes radical u. And there's a negative a half in front. Okay, so the game I play is, where's my function and its derivative almost? One minus x squared whose derivative is x almost. By almost, it mean I can get it if I multiply by a constant. <clears throat> that constant in this case is negative two, okay? You can't change to du until I see negative two x dx. The original did not have a negative two, had x dx, so stop, can't go any farther. You gotta show me the negative two, okay? So I just put in a negative two. You can do that with any real number. So negative two inside, negative a half outside, because negative a half times negative two is one, which means I'm not changing the value of the original integral. So now my integral is negative a half out front. Look at how much easier it becomes. Radical, instead of writing radical one minus x squared, is just radical u. And then negative two x dx, all within the green, erase that, change it to du. And now I'm good to go. Okay, so we know that's u to the one half, that says u to the one half. So negative a half, u to the three halves divided by three halves times two thirds plus a constant. Cancel, cancel. So I have left negative one third, u, change u back to what it was, one minus x squared to the three halves power plus a constant. Okay, and that's as much as I was going to show you today. Let me do my focus thing. I'll double check the chat also. If anybody, so if anybody has any other questions you can ask, we have, I don't know, seven minutes left. So my focusing thing for stuff we did on this page today. All that, chain rule reverse. There's the middle part.
Okay, and number seven. And that's as far as I'm going today. And if you want to see this one again, 5.335, about that also. Okay, so I was able to sneak in a little bit, so I'm a little bit ahead of schedule in case I start to fall behind. There's a lot more interesting stuff going on with 5.5, but I'll save that for tomorrow or the next day. Okay, let me check the chat. Okay, uh, I got that. Uh, yeah, attendance, okay, got that. All right, any other questions? And anybody again, if you join late, put your name in the chat so I can get you for attendance. So Miles, I'll get you later. Uh, let's see. Okay, think that. Okay, uh, any other questions? Otherwise, we're gonna call it a day. Okay, Christian got you. All right, so that'll be it, folks. So have a good day. We'll see you tomorrow. Please put your name in the chat if you join late, and we'll see everybody next time. Okay, bye, everybody. Have a good day.